of Chagask and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's uh, webinar which is the, the last in our Sheep Week events this evening here at Athenry. We have a really exciting program lined up for you tonight which is going to deal with policy and the environment and uh, we have a number of really really good speakers, top class speakers. Jack Dolan from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine is going to talk about environmental policy. My own colleagues uh, Kevin Hanrahan who is our economics experts here at Athenry will be dealing with cap reform and Brexit. Dominica Cole from our research centre in Johnstown Castle will be pointing out all of the solutions that farmers can use and sheep farmers in particular in regards to the environment. And finally, Michael Gottstein, who is head of sheep in Chagas, will be talking about all of the challenges and opportunities indeed for making decent profits from sheep production on the uplands and on the lowlands. So join me next in the studio. Good evening and welcome to Live at Atten Rai. We're broadcasting live from our studio here at Mellows Campus, Athen Rye. And this is the final event in the week-long Virtual Sheep Week. I'd like to, at the outset, acknowledge the financial support for this entire event uh, from FBD Insurance. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the area of policy and the environment. And there is an opportunity for you, the viewers, to ask questions of, the, of our panel, and all you have to do is type your questions into the comment box on whatever platform you're using. So let's meet uh, tonight's panel, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but first of all, we have Jack Nolan from uh, the department. Good evening, Jerry. Um, Jack Nolan, and I deal with water and biodiversity from a policy and regulatory point of view in the Department of Agriculture. Okay. And Kevin Hanrahan. Hi, I'm Kevin Hanrahan. I'm uh, Head of the Rural Economy Development Programme in Chagas, and I'm an economist. Dominica. Hi, I'm Dominica Krull. I'm a research officer in the area of gaseous emissions. So that's greenhouse gases and ammonia. And I'm based in Wexford and Johnston Castle in the Environment, Soils and Land Use Department. And we'll be joined later on by Michael Gottstein, who's Head of Knowledge Transfer for Sheep in Chagas. So you, you're all very welcome to this evening's um, webinar. Before we start, um, because of uh, urgent Shannon business, Minister P Pippa Hackett, who is Minister of State with responsibility for land use and, bi and biodiversity, can't be with us this evening in person. But she has um, produced a short video for us, which I think you'll agree, sets the, the scene very well for this evening's discussion. Good evening, everyone. I'm really sorry I cannot be with you this evening, but I have to be in the Shannad. Unfortunately, an unexpected time change in Oireachtas proceedings has delayed the final stages of the Bill on Forestry Appeals. I'm sure there are a few of you in forestry, and you might already be aware of the concerns in this sector. So you will know that this is an important piece of legislation which should go a long way to solving the backlogs that have arisen in the forestry sector. Anyway, enough about trees, what about sheep? With my husband, Mark, I am a sheep farmer myself in County Offaly. We have about 200 yos and also a herd of 25 suckler cows. Of course, we are lowland farmers and the closest thing that resembles a hill on our farm is a 1,000 year old mot in a field at the back of our house. We do occasionally let some sheep up there to graze, but they are not hard to find or get down afterwards. But this evening, I want to talk briefly about those of you who are upland sheep farmers. How we manage our uplands is becoming more and more important as Minister, I am responsible for EIP locally led schemes, and you may already be aware of some of the projects, and there are some excellent examples in hill settings all over the country. 
the McGillicuddy Reeks EIP, for example, is a terrific project. It has 36 mountain farmers all working together through positive grazing patterns. Initially, an assessment of the plant life on their farms is made with the assistance of an ecologist. Previously, there had been both undergrazing and overgrazing on these mountains, but under ecological guidance, these farmers are now changing patterns to attain optimum grazing. In addition, a number of the farmers have been trained to build mountain paths to keep the large number of recreational walkers from walking all over the land. And this has led to additional employment opportunities for these farmers on other walking trails, such as the Dingle Way. This scheme is certainly something which could be replicated in other areas of the country. There has also been a shift in mindset regarding the use of their animals for land management rather than solely for agricultural production. Cattle have also been introduced onto some parts to graze the moor grass that sheep won't eat and to trample the bracken. This programme is delivering a public good and farmers are getting paid for it. The uplands have so much to offer and properly managed can deliver premium quality food, thriving habitats for biodiversity, locations for natural woodlands, lands to sequester and store carbon, flood controlling catchments and deliver landscapes for recreation and tourism. All these aspects feature strongly in the new programme for government and I will do my utmost to ensure that farmers managing valuable uplands and indeed other lands too are supported and rewarded for doing so. Finally, I would like to see the final product, the lamb or the beef, which is produced from high nature areas reflected in consumer preferences and the market. Meanwhile, though, can I just say to all of you sheep farmers, not just the upland ones, thank you for your work. As one of you, I know how dedicated and committed you are. I hope you found the engagements over this virtual sheep week helpful and inspiring. So I will leave you to what is left of it. Again, I'm so very sorry to miss it in person, and I hope to catch up with you again very soon. Thank you. I think you'll all agree that was uh, an excellent uh, outline of the issues we'll be dis we're, we are concerned about this evening. And it's great to see the Minister having, obviously, a tremendous knowledge of environmental issues and challenges, but also an appreciation as a farmer of the issues confronting farmers generally. Jack, I'm, I'm going to turn to you, first of all, and, and uh, ask you the question, what are the environmental challenges that you say that sheep farmers face, bearing in mind we have a lowland sector and we have an upland sector? I suppose there are several, Jerry. We all know that um, the challenge of our times is climate, but also biodiversity. And under the Green Deal, farmers will be asked to do more. And we need to support farmers while they're doing it, but we also need the marketplace to come in. So, for example, farmers with high organic matter soils will be asked to store more carbon, to protect what they have and to do more. The same with biodiversity. Often there are high levels of biodiversity on sheep farms, which is excellent, but we need to do more because it's management we'll get paid for, not for keeping what we have, but actually improving it. On water quality, we need to keep, um, the trend at the moment is not great and we need to improve it. And every farmer has something to offer um, through being careful about the nutrients that they use, the chemicals that they use, in particular, say MCPA on wet ground, taking care, um, minding rushes and so on. And really what you'd recommend to all farmers is that they participate in knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer groups, take part in discussion groups so that they keep up to date and aware of the current issues. Mm. And of course, the sheep farmers on the lowlands face very similar challenges to other livestock sectors. But there, they, on the uplands then, there are huge opportunities as well in relation to managing yeah, management of the environment. Definitely. Like we need to store more carbon in Irish soils. Soils are so important because we ask them to filter the water, we ask them to grow a crop, and we also ask them to sequester carbon. And we need to do more about that. And hopefully in the future, there will be a market for carbon. There isn't at the moment. Mm. And that's when these type of soils could come into their own. But farmers will be doing more for that. It won't be a thing that the soil is there, just keep it as it is. You'll have to do more, but there are opportunities there. And there are other opportunities, as, as we'll see in the videos, around uh, tourism, agri-tourism and so on. And hopefully there'll be an income there that people can bring in. At the moment, the uplands and the western coast of Ireland receive the majority of money, say, from Gloss, for example. There are 50,000 farmers receiving about 250 million a year. So hopefully schemes like that will continue and we'll keep on incremental progress that will be improving our environmental footprint all the time. Okay. Can I bring in you, uh, Dominica, just on the, very, on the point that Jack was mentioning there in relation to the storage of carbon? From a scientific perspective, how feasible is it to accurately and rigorously measure 
carbon that's sequestered in, in agricultural soils? Um, it's absolutely feasible, um, but it is a long game. So our soils in general, but our soils in particular, uh, are already quite carbon rich. So we're very lucky in comparison to a lot of our uh, European counterparts that we have um, a really carbon rich soils. So first of all, I think it's important to, to remember to, to protect that carbon that's already there and, um, you know, and uh, tailor our management not to, not to lose that carbon. Uh, but in terms of adding more, so because there's already a lot of carbon in the soils, we're talking about adding a small pool every year, uh, a, a small addition to already a large pool. So it really does take uh, a while to, to, to get a really good uh, handle on it. Um, but it's definitely feasible. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it, it, it's really needed. So we do need to get a good handle on, on our um, a carbon storage and additional sequestration in Ireland. So we, we do need a national network, a kind of monitoring network of carbon um, in the soil. Um, mm -hmm. From scientific perspective, it's absolutely doable, and um, you know we're kind of we're we're very happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, we already have a number of projects um, in different capacities. Um, but I would really say the kind of a national monitoring network is, is something okay. is the direction and, that we should be traveling. But clearly in. important, as you said there, and I think it's an issue that people often get confused about. There's a large stock of carbon. But what matters is the addition or subtraction from that stock. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kevin, can I bring you in here? Jack uh, raised the exciting possibility that farmers might be able to get a monetary dividend mm -hmm. on the carbon that is sequestered. How realistic is that? And, and over what time frame could that actually emerge? Well, well, it's realistic in the sense that there are other market, other industries which are which have which are in their carbon markets at the moment. I think the difficulty in terms of getting this market that will that potentially could give a return to farmers for, for sequestering additional carbon is the fact that there are so many farmers in, in the European or in Irish context. So the challenge of, of, of monitoring and verifying uh, what they're doing in addition to their baseline level, establishing their baseline level, mm -hmm. and then establishing robustly the relationship between additional carbon sequestered and farm practices that we can observe uh, without having to measure every, every piece of ground. So that'll be the big challenge as compared to a, a coal burning energy station where we can put a monitor on the flue and we know what comes out. It's a little bit more challenging when you've got millions of, of farms all having an impact in terms of setting up that market. But I think over time, some of these technical challenges and market challenges can be tackled get the right carbon price right, create that incentive for farmers to do things differently. Dominique, could you bring you just back to, for, to for, in a, for, for a minute on the point of whether there is a distinction in terms of the challenges in measuring the carbon that is sequestered in the uplands and the lowlands. Is there any issue that arises there? Or what would you expect to be the situation? Right. Um, I mean, in terms of methodologies, they, they can be the same, um, but they're very different soil types. So we're in the lowlands, we mostly have mineral soils, but we can also have mineral organic soils and, and a mixture of both. Um, uplands are predominantly um, organic soils, so peatlands. So they all, they, you know, the, the carbon content of those soils is already huge, vastly different um, between those. So it, it really depends on the soil type, on the area, on the management. Um, so it's large variability there. In terms, okay. of, in terms of kind of solid methods, um, the, the same methodology can be applied. Um, but the typical methodology is looking at the changes in stocks over time. Jack, did you want to come in on that point? Well, it, it was just on something else, actually. It's just okay. um, uplands, say, a lot of the uplands are actually protected areas or Natura 2000 sites. And people that are farming on these are facing more restrictions than those on the lowland. And it'd be great if the market would pay them for that, mm -hmm. for what they're doing, for the extra, say, so lamb that's coming from there, like Ackle lamb or something, there'd be a group, and that that could be marketed. And people in a the shop then could actually say, right, I want to support these protected areas. I'll pay extra for that lamb. And there's a dividend then for those people that are mm -hmm. farming under more restrictions than the majority of farmers in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So biodiversity and the protection of these sites is so important. It's something that's being identified under the Green Deal that we'll have to protect more areas. And farmers do face extra restrictions because of that. Well, can I bring Kevin in on that point then? I mean, 
I think we all can appreciate that there is value that's added because yeah. of the nature of the production system. But yet the market doesn't seem to reflect that. What, what's, what has to happen? I think, I think it reflect, I mean, society, it's a societal problem. I think society uh, expresses its, its priorities in some sense through markets. And it's about getting people to actually place more value on these characteristics of the products because heretofore they haven't done enough of that. And I think that's part of what's within the European Union's Green Deal is actually shifting people's perceptions of what's important and actually persuading them that paying an extra uh, euro per kilogram for a product that's inherently different in terms of what its impact is and its characteristics uh, is something that, they, that that's worth doing because it makes their world a better place. So it's connecting that consumption behavior with the world in which we live in, which people have gotten very disconnected from. And it's about tying those two ends together in some sense. But is it about then providing more information to the consumer about the distinctive the distinctiveness I think of, about, of the farming system. It's about, it's about it's about that, but also about on the on the supply side as well as actually encouraging farmers to they come together. Like if, if if we can persuade consumers that this is something worth paying more for, and if that more is coming back to the farmer, the farmer will respond with the knowledge that we can give them about how to do things better, and you get a kind of a virtuous cycle going there potentially. Um, so it's about, it's about trying to change a system that in some aspects doesn't seem to be working for farmers and doesn't seem to be working for, for the consumers who want to, pay, want to support a better environment. Mm-hmm. Jack, yeah? We're spending about half what we used to spend on food 25 years ago. So it used to be 28% of a household income went on food, and now it's about 14%. Mm-hmm. So food is very, very cheap. And because of that, about a third of the food in Ireland each year is thrown in the bin. And that's a terrible situation, and that's damaging the environment. And I agree 100% with what Kevin says. Consumer attitudes have to change. We need behavioural change, that people value food more. They pay a little bit more for it. They'll waste less. It's better for the environment. Because it all comes back, if a farmer is only making €3 Euro per lamb or whatever, or 30 they keep more lambs to make a reasonable income, which is fair from a farmer's point of view. Jack, could I just um, ask you a question in relation to um, soil management and improving uh, soil fertility? Should... Should they be part of future environmental schemes? I think the sequestration of carbon definitely should, and improving management that way, improving the structures of soil should. I don't think basic things like uh, using phosphorus and potassium and lime should be, because that's like putting oil in the engine of the car. Like we have only about 14% of soils functioning at an optimum from an agronomic point of view. Not all soils need to be pumping out grass like a dairy farmer at 15 tonnes per hectare. But if we expect to take a cut of silage off land, the very least we should be doing is putting back the nutrients that are used. And at the moment, we don't. And I don't think the taxpayer, the European taxpayer or the Irish taxpayer, would see value in that, in giving money to a farmer for something he should be doing. There is value in paying a farmer to sequester carbon, to protect water, to change their habits, you know, fertiliser use and so on, but definitely not to get soils fertile so that they're making a decent living from it. There's better value for money from other things. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, I mean, mm-hmm. would, what's your reaction public, to that? Public money for public goods. And, and mm-hmm. I think if, if the benefits are, are almost exclusively private in terms of the soil fertility, there's, there's limited So what, what public supports then are you talking about uh, are needed in relation to, say, hill sheep farming, for example? Well, you know, you're, if you look at... You look at the support that they're currently getting and the income levels they're making on, on, on the hill, they're at a net margin level, they're not making any money for you. Okay. So, they're, so their incomes are completely dependent on, on payments from the common agricultural policy, both to pillar one and pillar two. And I guess in terms of the redesign of the cap, that's going to follow from uh, soon an imminent agreement on the nature of the cap reform. You know, there will be more incentives to be doing things over and above what we are doing already in terms of our practices, our management practices. Thanks, Kevin. Well, that's, I think, there's a very positive message there to counteract the, the negative narrative in relation to farming and the environment. Here we're seeing that there are opportunities and, and that farmers can grasp to improve the biodiversity, particularly in the upland areas, and also the opportunity presented for the sequestration of carbon. Recently, uh, we caught up with um, Catherine McIntyre, who is farming in Donegal and has developed a farming system which combines efficient sheep production with good environmental practices.
I'm so Catherine McIntyre. I have a mixed farm here um, just outside Lifford in County Donegal. I have 300 ewes. We will start to lamb now at the end of February, beginning of March, and hopefully have them all gone by the end of March. We aim for about 1.7, 1.8, um, and get them away off the farm early. Uh, the two most important things would be the number of lambs per yo and reared on grass. Grass is critically important to us. I, la I market my lambs through the East Donegal uh, sheep group. I find it excellent. We aim to buy four and five star rams and that helps us to get the quality of lamb and to get them away early. We try to keep costs down and profits up. Try to get uh, clover rich grass and in this field here, we have a uh, forage rape as well, which we find sends the lambs on very well. Um, and as you can see, the clover strike has been very good in this field. I try to uh, join every scheme that is going. Um, I'm in sheep group and the cattle group, which I find very informative and very interesting. I would be involved with GLASS. I have also been a participant in the sheep welfare schemes and in other schemes. We would have uh, long-eared owls here and we try to have a uh, habitat for them. I plant a uh, board cover. We maintain our hedgerows, we hope, to the proper way. Um, we have them cut uh, bird-friendly times. I have a forage strip, but I have a catch crop that will go in now once the barley is cut and gone. Um, I find uh, no problem in uh, maintaining biodiversity along with my sheep flock and my other projects on the farm. We try to uh, help the environment along. Um, we try not to do anything that would damage the soil or damage the, the area. Well, that was a really inspirational video, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, it's clear that Catherine is farming very efficiently and she's also extremely conscious of her environmental responsibilities and indeed, I think, the opportunities that exist. Clearly on her farm, she's making excellent use of grass, clover, high genetic merit rams, productive yews, and at the same time, she's focusing on the maintenance of the hedgerows the provision of board cover, provision of habitats, for example, for long-eared owls. And she's also championing farmers to utilize the various environmental schemes, such as GLOSS and, of course, the knowledge transfer scheme. We've also just got a question in, uh, Jack, that I'm going to put to you, which is related to the video in a way from Porrick. And um, he asks, I think, a, a really searching question as to whether you'd agree that grazing free-roaming sheep on the hills, is that compatible with restoring species and habitats? And more, he also asks, are there examples of, that demonstrate that compatibility? I think grazing is essential at the right stocking rate and with the right type of stock and at the right type of year. And that involves a lot of management. And there are examples in the EIPs where grazing is being, say, for example, in Wicklow, in Connemara, where management plans are in place and farmers are being paid more to actually shepherd the flocks. I think it's really important looking at Catron there. Catron is a participant in the GLOSS. It's worth 250 million a year to Irish farmers. And what it's done and what you can see through Catron is an enthusiasm for agriculture. It's great to see a woman speaking. Only 12% of the heads of farms in Ireland are women on the latest CSO survey, which is actually holding us back, I believe. We need more female involvement for innovation and for development. She also seems a very happy, enthusiastic person. And I don't think farmers are looking after their health enough. It's something that she obviously is. She's in a good place. It was announced today on the paper, farmers are actually a vulnerable group for COVID because they suffer from such, such ill health. And I think we need healthy farmers to lead to a healthy environment. But there are examples, though, of we, where we can demonstrate that compatibility the, between... The Burren is the best example yeah. in Ireland. Where, Like we were just talking earlier, Kevin was mentioning that um, in the Burren where you see some hazel now, it wasn't there on old photos. And that's been reintroduced, sorry, the grazing of animals has been reintroduced to Burren Winteridge, the winter program there where they actually have a festival of returning animals to the Burren for the winter is fantastic. They do something the same in Austria. And a brilliant thing about the Burren is community involvement. When you go down there and speak to the farmers, they're proud of what they're doing. 
They've been listened to, though, as well. That's a really integral part of it, that the farmers are part of the solution. They know the land best, and they're restoring the burn. But you'd like to see them getting a financial reward for that, which is coming through the burn programme. Thanks, Jack. Um, Douglas likes to emphasise, Kevin, the importance of looking at the concept of sustainability in the round. Mm. And economic sustainability is very important. Fortunately, this has been a good year for uh, sheep prices. Why is that? Uh, well, I think, in my opinion, the, the reason why sheep prices are, 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 are up this year versus last year, in contrast to most other, most other agricultural prices in Ireland, is because of Brexit, in fact, and things that are happening in a very far away in China. So on the Brexit side, British farmers last year basically weren't feeling very optimistic about their markets for lamb, and a lot fewer ewes were put on lamb, and lamb volume, the volume of output is down, and their exports into the European market are down this year versus last year. So there's less supply from, from the UK, uh, and the New Zealand are, are, are busy shipping lots of lamb to, to China because of African swine fever, uh, and their imports, the imports from New Zealand into the European Union are, are down. So we've had a contraction in supply of lamb, the availability of lamb on the European market, that has been larger than the fall in demand. And, and demand for lamb has fallen like it has for other meats because of the impact of COVID on the, on the hospitality sector. But the balance between the two for lamb has been, has been different than it was for, for, for other meats. And that's been to the advantage of our sheep farmers, who this year will see higher prices and compared to last year are killing more lambs. So... It's a good story. Okay. And Kevin, just um, maybe for, for the benefit and interest of viewers, how does the economic performance of sheep enterprise compare with other farming enterprises? Well, if, listen, the, the, the incomes earned on the average Irish sheep farm aren't, are lower than the average dairy farm, but they are on a par, including all the direct payments from the cap with, with incomes earned in cattle rearing and cattle and cattle finishing systems. Uh, at an enterprise level, when we don't think about the direct payments, uh, the lowland sheep enterprise consistently returns a positive net margin. And we can't, unfortunately, say the same thing about the two cat, principal cattle enterprises, cattle finishing and cattle rearing. So it's, it's, it's in a relatively good place compared to other dry stock enterprises. The hill enterprise, like I mentioned a few moments ago, doesn't return a, a positive net margin on a, re, on a consistent basis. And that just underlines the importance of the payments that farmers in upland areas receive for other services they provide to, to society in terms of maintaining their income levels. Those income levels are, are at a relatively low level, but they are close to the, the kind of income levels made on other dry stock enterprises. Well, that's a really interesting point in relation to the lowlands, because yeah. net margin is really the critical economic barometer, isn't it? Yeah. Much more important and uh, relevant than gross margin. Um, Dominica, what's your assessment of the environmental performance on, on Catherine's farm? Um, I'm very impressed with Catherine. Um, I really enjoyed the video. You know, it, it's very clear that one, Catherine is a very good farmer and, um, and is a re it, it's a really good example of a farm. And she's also very passionate about what she's doing and, you know, looking after one, the farm business, but also looking after the, the, the habitats on the farm. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm very positive. Um, you know, there, there, there were points that, that, that Catherine mentioned in the video um, that really strike in terms of the, the really the, the good genetic merit of the, of the flock that she has. Um, her, uh, the diversity of her grazing ground, she uses clover. Um, she also, uh, you know, she also sows um, bird cover uh, where there's tillage on the farm. Uh, she uses catch crops. Um, so, you know, there, there's really plenty going on there for both productivity um, and uh, biodiversity and other ecosystem services. Um, and at the same time, I think what was really, um, really nicely highlighted in Catherine's video is that participation in a lot of schemes, uh, knowledge transfer, discussion groups. Um, you know, Catherine said that uh, she, she participates in, in anything that's mm. going and um, it, it really shows you that that passion for um, farming and also for learning, uh, for always always wanting to to improve uh, the management and trying to find out something new. Um, so, oh, overall, I think that was a you know that that was a really good example of a of a sheep mm. farmer. No, I, we we all I think can appreciate the the huge uh, environmental value of the uplands mm. in 
either from something the, the visual aspect or its use, the uplands as a, as a recreational uh, source, if you like, of, of enjoyment and so forth. But Jack, is that view, is that accepted as being really important to society, say, at EU level? I think it is, because if you look at the amount of money that comes into Ireland every year from the EU taxpayer, <coughs> 1.7, 1.8 billion, I think, in direct payments, Gloss, the, our flagship agri-environmental scheme, 50,000 farmers, mainly along the West Coast. Areas of natural constraints, a large amount of money coming out again. And then you have convergence. A lot of these farms, as Kevin said, would have low basic payments or low average entitlements. And over the last programming period, convergence has moved about 100 million from higher to low value um, entitlement holders. But I'd also say the marketplace and industry have a role to play here. Society, people want to have holiday homes in the west of Ireland and come and visit the uplands and admire their beauty. So how is that coming back to the farmer? Because the farmer has created that environment through their management practice. We want them to continue that. We don't want the uplands to be abandoned, coming back to your earlier question. We want active management, active participation. So it'd be great to see society actually support that, as well as subsidies. Because we must remember, subsidies are not index linked. So in real terms, they're going down in value to the farmer. And there's a limit to what farmers can do with that amount of money. And we're expecting more and more of them as well. So we need society and industry to step into this space and support farmers to take the actions that we want in protecting the uplands. Well, could I ask you, you mentioned glass, and obviously glass is huge, been hugely important as, a, as an income support, as well as obviously a scheme that protects the environment. Do we need to redesign glass or the new glass, if you like, for the situation that exists in the uplands in particular? Uh, there are some fantastic elements to GLOSS. We have common age, common, common age management plans where people are taking collective action, which is great. We also have the EIPs, which you're going to see a video mm -hmm. on later, which are excellent examples of local farmers coming up with solutions to local problems. So perhaps in the future, there should be a mixture between the two. We're not going to have probably EIPs all over the country. We will still have a major flagship scheme. And that delivers huge environmental benefit. Like if you see the wild bird cover, the catch crops that... Um, Dominica mentioned that Catherine showed us in the video. They're valuable whether they're in Donegal or Cork or Wexford. So there are things like that, then with perhaps add-ons for other specific issues locally. Okay. That leads me, Kevin, to ask uh, what's, what's in store for the sheep sector in regards to uh, cap reform? I mean, I think farmers often approach this sort of seven-year cycle of cap reform with a lot of trepidation and, and worry about what it's going to do to their, to their incomes and to what they have to do as farmers. But I don't think in particular for our sheep farmers that, they, that this reform necessarily is something that's going to be a threat to them. I think uh, at its heart, it's reflecting the, the sort of the zeitgeist or the, the, the political movement <coughs> towards uh, supporting action by farmers and other parts of society that do does more for the environment. So I think farmers that do more for the environment and to support biodiversity and to help fight against uh, climate change will be rewarded for doing so. Uh, and I think the, the convergence process, for example, that, that, that was mentioned a moment ago, um, in the last reform was in favour of, of low intensity farmers who had lower entitlements per hectare. And I think insofar as that will continue under the next uh, seven year uh, framework, um, that will also uh, under, continue to underpin the incomes of farmers that are farming at a low intensity, such as our sheep farmers. So I don't think there's anything for farmers to be worried about. In fact, there's actually the prospect of things to be really excited about and to embrace uh, going forward. Sorry, Sorry, Jack. Yes. I just think Catherine was excellent in the video because she's continuously trying to improve. And the cap should be seen as an opportunity like that. Yeah. We need to continue improving. We're exporting about 14 billion worth of agricultural product every year based on our reputation as a clean, green country with good water quality, minimum impact on the environment. And consumers won't accept long term that we're damaging the environment. So we need to keep gradually upping our game. We don't need switch overnight, but keep improving. Yeah, we, uh, We've got a, a very good question in here for, for Jack in relation to um, whether we will have an environmental scheme next year uh, to succeed GLASS. As you know, this is a question that comes in from, the, from a farmer in the west of Ireland. And by the way, to remind all the viewers again, to please send in your questions, any questions you have for members of the panel. Jack, what's your... Uh, it's a very good question. Presumably we will be. The regulations are still being agreed at the moment, as is the budget, so there is uncertainty. But you'd presume there will be, but I won't give any guarantees to anybody because the regulations aren't signed off yet. There will likely be a transitional period of two years between CAP programmes 
And during that, you would expect to have a major agri-environmental scheme. It's expected that we will do more for the environment under the Green Deal. There's also new funding called New Generation Money, which is coming as part of the Green Deal, that Ireland will aim to avail of. So it's likely to be there, but I'm not given any guarantees. Okay, well, that's, that's understandable, Jack. And again, another uh, big issue that's looming there for all of the sector, indeed for the economy, uh, Kevin, is Brexit. Yep. And what's in store for the sheep sector, in your uh, estimation? In, in our estimation, I think the, sh the sheep sector, narrowly understood in terms of the prices that farmers get for the lands they sell, it stands to, to, to benefit whether we have a a no free trade deal with the UK as they as they leave the transition period, or whether at the end of this year they 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 don't agree anything with the European Union in terms of the future trade relationship. I think either way, um, there will be additional costs to doing business with the UK, and that the UK will have in doing business with the European Union, and that will make in the best case scenario their lamb less competitive on European markets, and that will be in a narrowly defined way good for Irish sheep farmers. The issue is that that. It cuts both ways in the sense that it, the gains that we might make on, on land prices because of Brexit will be more than offset than by the losses we will make on cattle and other agricultural yeah. output prices. And that's, that's, where, that's where what might appear to be a gain is actually unlikely to, to, be, to be one in, in aggregate. So the negotiations are still going on. There's another round of negotiations next week that's looking at the, the level playing field governance and fisheries issues. Um, I think everybody's still working both from the UK and the European Union side to get a, a deal or an agreement on trade. Um, and hopefully that's what we get. Uh, we've got another question for you, Jack. Um, and again, it's a, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a valid question in the sense that when we look at changes in the environment, they're very much long term in terms of their potential impact. And uh, the measures take time to bed down and so on. And, and uh, John Joe asks, do we need a, a longer environmental scheme, if you like, one that would stretch over 10 years instead of five years? Yeah, I suppose the he's 100% right. The environment does take a long time to change. Um, the programming period for CAP is seven years, and that's why our schemes are like that. But there's opportunities there, as I said before, for industry to come in to support farmers. Mm -hmm. Like if we were living in Holland, I'd get extra money from my milk if I have more biodiversity area on my farm. I'd get a cheaper loan from the bank. So it'd be great to see some corporate social responsibility. You know this CSR money? Yes. Because there's huge claims in the press at the moment from banks and so on and from industry about their environmental awareness. Well, would they like to come and invest it in agriculture? And that would support schemes. Okay. Now, um, one of the most innovative developments, in my view anyway, in the curtain cap has been um, the European innovation uh, programs. And... Um, Many of them, or most of them indeed, have looked at environmental related issues, and Chagask is supporting many of these um, programs uh, at ground level. In our next video now, we catch up with um, a colleague, uh, Catherine Keane, who is Chagask's countryside management specialist, who discusses one such um, EIP project, along with farmer Finton Joyce. Irish Uplands grazed mainly by hill sheep, provide us with many services. As well as producing quality hill lamb, uplands regulate water flow, helping to prevent flooding. They purify water, giving us pristine water quality. Uplands sequester carbon. Upland areas are used for leisure and recreation by tourists and ourselves. And they are good for the well-being of all who visit, supporting positive mental health. And of course, our uplands are rich in biodiversity. Our uplands need to be grazed in order to deliver the ecosystem services I spoke of. But each habitat needs a different stocking rate. Now we have a number of European innovation projects funded by of Agriculture, who are looking at upland issues. One of these is the North Connemara locally led agri-environment scheme. I suppose I'd be very positive about the whole program. Um, I like the fact that it's locally led, that the people that run it are, are local and that all their various 
uh, stakeholders were brought to the table in the beginning to set out the stall from the department and the management and the farmers on the ground. The tasks I'm involved in in particular are the, the management of the blackface sheep on the commonage. Um, we're doing that through a, a, a few different ways. The first one is to breed uh, the lambs and continue to breed the lambs in particular areas that could do with the increase in the number slightly on those areas and, and to possibly decrease slightly on other areas. can also do it with uh, mineral supplementation through mineral feed buckets or mineral lick buckets can be placed in certain areas where we would like to slightly increase the numbers. Slow progress, but it, we are getting there. There's um, lots of different tasks within the IPs and um, some of those tasks are very suitable to, to some of the farms and some more of the tasks aren't. And uh, it's a good lesson to learn the ones that don't succeed as much as it is the ones that do succeed. And they will hopefully feed into future agri-environmental schemes and so on. I would be very hopeful for the future of family farms in this area. Um, you know, once you've got environmental studies done, like what's been done here uh, through the EIP programme, you know, and put a put a value on what it is we're doing here and that we can continue to keep the bio, biodiversity in, in the manner in which it is at the moment and possibly improve as time goes on, I think there's quite a good future in the family farm in this area. What's clearly, to me, any really important and distinctive about the EIP program is that the farmer is placed at the centre of the activity that's going on on, the, on these projects. And of course, the farmer is supported by other experts and so on. It's very much a partnership. Jack, what's your assessment of the, e, the EIP scheme? I think they're excellent. The enthusiasm farmers show for it are great. And that's because they're asked their opinion and asked, look, we have an issue here. How are we going to solve it? Like uh, Finton said there, we're making steady progress, slow or steady progress, but we're making progress. And it's a great opportunity for farmers to become involved. And it highlights the enthusiasm farmers have to protect the environment once they're consulted on it. I'd also like to congratulate my colleagues in the Department of Agriculture and Fairness to them because it's a leap of faith for the department, both from Johnstown Castle and Port Leash. It also highlights another issue that we have with regulation that I should have raised earlier around the eligible hectare, mm. that sometimes there's contradictions between basic payment and what we have in Pillar 2. And our ministers have raised this in Brussels, that areas that we want farmers to protect should be eligible for Pillar 1, whether they're in an agri-environmental scheme or not. And that's really important. And that's a lot of the feedback that's coming from EIPs as well, that, look, we want to protect these areas, mm -hmm. but under Pillar 1, we can't. And what, we what the department hopes is that in the future, the learnings that we have and the measures that are coming out of these EIPs will be scaled up in the next class, as you said earlier. I think there are, Catherine was telling me that there are, I think five upland yeah. areas involved, isn't that right? Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're excellent. And what they're finding, say, the one in Wicklow, for example, is called the Sewer Upland Pro Program, but it needs to involve all the farmers. Because if you have farmers on one side of the hill managing the stock, like we were talking about earlier with the burn with grazing, and the farmers on the other side are overgrazing or undergrazing, we're not getting the success that we want. So it really does take a combined approach. And in that particular example, farmers are being, they're being paid for shepherding to go up and move the stock, to put licks in certain areas where we want the stock to come because neither overgrazing nor undergrazing are desirable. Dominique, can I bring you on an, on an aspect that's, uh, I think, important in this, in this uh, discussion? And that is, we are, uh, Chagas is a knowledge research-based organisation, but of course, knowledge is not really valuable unless it's taken up by farmers. And... Um, but what is the nature of Chongas research that's underway at present that is supporting farmers to help them through EIPs and other mechanisms to achieve their environmental objectives? Right. So, first of all, we've we've really big and um, an extensive program of research in that into that environmental sustainability. So, be it Geisha's emissions or um, soil or water quality or uh, biodiversity. Um, you know, we're, we're very active in all of them. Um, our research is uh, primarily applied. So it aims to uh, focus on science-based solutions for the farmers um, to help them with farm management. And like there's, there, there's a lot of specific areas where we're active in. So I kind of just want to maybe touch on a few of them. Um, there's, um, you might have seen on Tuesday uh, that we were doing research into um, methane emissions uh, from ruminants. 
So using the green feed and pack chambers, um, we, we're looking at breeding sheep of a better genetic merit that are, um, that are better productivity, but at the same time are low methane emitters. Um, we also have a project here in Atten Rye, actually with my PhD student, that's looking at another greenhouse gas, um, um, nitrous oxide, and that's from sheep excreta. Uh, we already did a similar work for cattle, and what we found out was the emissions were actually lower than um, what we would have known using international kind of calculations and coefficients. So it's great to have that local data for Ireland. And what it meant as well is it, it was taken up by the um, National uh, Greenhouse Gas Inventory and it reduced our emissions. So it's a really good news story. And that's what we're trying to do for sheep now and you know, for, for, for that enterprise. Um, in terms of um, soil health, you know, we, we've loads of pro, uh, projects on uh, be it soil fertility and nutrient carbon sequestration, soil health, uh, soil microbial diversity. Um, on the water quality side, um, we have a, the agricultural catchments program where we're working with farmers in six catchments across the country, one of them being in Craig Duff in County Mayo, so not too far from here. And um, it, it's a long term monitoring project where we're really looking at solutions. Um, of how to uh, maintain and improve water quality in, in those agricultural areas. Um, and on biodiversity, for example, like we, we've research going on on both the diversity of the grazing grounds, so the mixed species swords, but also on habitats and habitat management, restoration. Um, we're involved in habitat mapping with Bordbia and through the NFS. Um, and, you know, th there was a question there about um, grazing and how compatible it is. Um, what Jack mentioned uh, was the barren life, but also our in life. We've seen, um, you know, how important that grazing is uh, for that for that species, uh, rich grasslands. So there's really plenty there and and it is re it is very applied. Uh, so it serves the farmers um, and it also leads us to, you know, having that really sound um, research base um, so that we can um, look at in a higher level analysis, uh, which one of them is a marginal abatement cost curve um, or MAC for short, um, and where we can look at a suite of measures for any particular environmental issue we're looking Maybe at. Maybe if I bring in Kevin and uh, no, Jackie Winnicom, we just... Your colleagues in rural economy have been involved in, in building this MAC. And by the way, it's not a big MAC. It's marginal abatement, cost curve is a bit of a mouthful. In simple terms, can you give us a couple of examples, Kevin, of the measures that uh, are included in the so-called MAC? Well, well, some of them are about uh, economic breeding, breeding indices. So that's so on the sheep side in terms of breeding sheep that are that are lower emitters and are sheep that have produced more lambs per, per, per ewe. Um, there are things that are sort of efficiency measures that are making the farm more uh, biologically efficient uh, mm -hmm. processes that get, give us the agricultural output that we, that we rely on in terms of our food industry, but do so at a lower environmental footprint, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions or our ammonia as the latest MAC is. Um, then there are other measures within the MAC, uh, such as low emissions slurry spreading technologies, that, that have a positive cost, you know, to, mm. to, to, to change mm. that technology might cost money. So then it's about whether the, 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 the cost to society and the cost to farmers of engaging in that change is, is offset and more than offset by the savings in terms of the, the, low, the, the lower emissions associated with, with using that rather than an old splash plate technology. So it's, it's assessing those different types of, 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 of innovations that farmers can engage with and assessing what, for the average farm, the costs of those actions would be and what the benefits are in terms of... of, of the Jack, I'll bring you in this implementation is, yeah. is, is critical. And, and also, uh, if we look at the sheep sector, there are hardly the biggest emitters out there. You know, isn't that the case? Yeah, but everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a part to play in the environment. And what's hugely important, the Department of Agriculture invests substantial money every year in research, that that money is translated onto the ground and that farmers take that action. For example, here on Monday night, Michal O'Leary was talking about measuring grass. And it's only when you measure something, you know what you have and you can act on it. The department grants aid, grant aids people to buy equipment to measure grass. The department grant aids low emission slurry spreading equipment. 
But we, what we really need is communication. And we need a coherent message coming to farmers from industry and from the state, which means yourself in the advisory service, also private advisors and the department. And that's coming, that's based on research. So that we can say to farmers, look, we have the science behind this. We know that it works, but now we need you to do it. Dominique, can I bring you in again on an aspect of the science? You know, science doesn't stand still. And uh, I know there are very exciting, um, re there is very exciting research on their way, which probably won't bear fruition in terms of actual solutions in relation to the environmental challenges for some time to come. But maybe you might give us a flavor of what we can expect over the next decade or so. I mean, there, there, there's plenty going on <laughs> and, you know, there will be, there, there, so there will be a lot of research into the particular areas that I mentioned um, earlier. Um, so maybe kind of moving on from the kind of components to that higher level, such as the, such as the max, uh, if I can focus on that. Um, I think what we have now is the two max, one for greenhouse gases, one for ammonia. And, um, I think a few things will happen into the future, one being an integrated MAC. This is something that's really badly needed. We have all that component research and we really have to start putting it together uh, to look at synergies and avoid any pollution swapping um, so that we need to look at the different environmental bads and goods uh, in, that, in one analysis. So we need to bring in, for example, water quality and biodiversity into the MAC. Um, the other thing is, this is a very high level analysis, so it's at a national scale, um, and we really need to drill down now. So we're moving from that one size fits all approach to a very tailored on farm approach of what's appropriate for a particular farmer. Um, mm. So there, that analysis really needs to move on to, to you know, a particular farm. And from that, it really needs to have some kind of user friendly interface, like a decision support tool, where it's up to a farmer to make, you know, to, to, to see a suite of options available to them and make a decision what's the most appropriate and, um, and which measures they can, that's they can engage with. to minimize the cost of application. Yeah. Jack, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, I just want to back up what Dominique is saying about an integrated MAC. I think it's so important that we treat the environment as one, not as separate pillars for biodiversity or water. And if people just look at Catherine at the first video there, what she's doing is reducing nitrogen use through all the various different measures that she's taking. <coughs> like sheep farmers do use fertilizer, even though it's a small amount, get the soil fertile, promote biodiversity on the farm. And there are improvements that can be made, but we do need to think in the round rather than of climate or water or biodiversity being separate. If you do something for one, it'll benefit everything. And reducing nitrogen is a simple, clear message that every farmer should take. Okay. Kevin, have you any observation to make on that? The importance of linking you know, the different actions that a farmer can take in terms of impact on environmental... Yeah, I, 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 I think we need to uh, do a better job in terms of communicating what, what, how feasible these actions are. And I think the Signpost mm -hmm. Farms Initiative that Chagas will be running will, will be part of that. But also helping farmers to understand their underlying economics and their costs of doing the different options so that what might seem infeasible, you can either confirm that it, it doesn't work for them but you can also hopefully show that there are many other of the other measures that would actually work in their context because mm. farms are all different, uh, fields and within farms are different, but we, so we need to not have just a one-size-fits-all mm. approach. It needs to be more uh, tailored and bespoke. Mm. And I think it's, it's finding that sweet spot between having a, a plan for every farm but having measures that work for different types of farms out there. In, in, okay, in, and in, as you in, mentioned uh, uh, the signpost farms idea, but clearly, for that to work, it's going to have to be a partnership involving industry. And Jack, you made that point several times. Uh, mm -hmm. The private sector needs to get involved uh, alongside farmers, alongside the department, yep. alongside the likes of Chagas and Board B, all working together, because this, this is a challenge for the entire industry. Um, okay, we, we have um, now moved to our, to our final video of the evening. And in our final video clip, um, our production team travelled to Mayo to meet a farmer who has focused on maximising biodiversity on a commercial sheep farm with a significant tourist business as well. 
This wildlife corridor consists of over a thousand trees, native woodland, there's silver birch, mountain ash and oak. It was an initiative that we undertook when we opened our agritourism business here on the farm where we welcome visitors from all over the world. So it was really to offset our carbon footprint and it was our contribution to that. So we're delighted that it's a uh, blossoming away and growing away and it's a delight to have it. It's also a great shelter for our sheep here because the wind funnels in from the Duloc Valley so it gives them a nice area to shelter. We're very very fortunate uh, that Len Keane Farm is part of the Mwilra Shafri uh, complex under the EU designation of special area of conservation. This landscape both upland and lowland still retains the ecology of the ice age. So we're especially proud of that. And uh, we really see ourselves as caretakers of protecting the natural habitats here, which consist of, um, there's lots of sphagnum mosses, which there's peatland habitats. There's Arctic alpine plants here from growing still from the ice age. And of course, the natural water, water courses, one of which is the Karaniski River. The Karaniski River has a level five rating. It's one of the cleanest rivers in Europe. It's a salmon spawning river and it flows right through the Glen Keane Farms. We are part of the Pearl Mussel Project. Part of our common edge runs in and the water courses are on that. And actually the Bundereha area has the highest level of the Pearl Mussel catchment in Ireland. So um, we're really proud to be part of that project. It's a tremendous project and really it endorses the special area of conservation and all of the natural habitats that we have here in this region. As farmers, we're caretakers for the future of farming and future generations. And we're so lucky that this ecology still remains here today. And that's through the hands of previous generations looking after and caring for the environment and so we all have to do our bit and we're really happy to do it. Well, we're very lucky and a lot of our visitors are really uh, in awe when they come here and they see and they feel and they experience all of the nature and the wild habitats that really don't exist in their country at all. So we're especially proud to showcase it to the rest of the world as well. Haven't we an absolutely beautiful country? Um, and credit to the team for the fantastic shots that were taken on, on that farm. Um, before we, I just get into some questions on that video, um, Kevin, we had a, a question in from Andrew on the topic of the wool market, how it's now a financial burden. Mm. Are, are there any opportunities for resurrecting wool as a valuable commodity in your opinion? Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think there is in the short run. I don't think there, there's enough people willing to to uh, have wool, woolen carpets in their homes or to be wearing woolen clothes uh, at a global level to basically to take wool back to where it was in the 1950s. I think it's going to be, unfortunately, for many farmers, a cost rather than a revenue okay. source. I should have said, ladies and gentlemen, viewers, uh, we've been joined on the platform here by Michael Gottstein. Michael uh, is head of Knowledge Transfer in the sheep sector uh, in Chagas. Jack, that was a fantastic video. What's your reaction to it? I think it's excellent. Yeah. And again, I think it's fantastic to see a female farmer. They're making the most of their environment. They're protecting, they're protecting it biodiversity, but they also see the value in it because it was mentioned there about the shelter that's coming from it, natural capital, the natural beauty. So they are making money from it. So they have another income stream. And that seems to be the way we're going to have to go in the Western areas where you know, we're going to make as much as we can from tourism, from farming and so on. And then we hope subsidies will support as well. But overall, it's fantastic to see the enthusiasm, the knowledge of the environment that's there was outstanding as well. And a credit to the farmers involved. And I think sometimes farmers don't get enough credit for what they're doing for the environment and for their knowledge of it. And you can see the, you know, the tourism potential of our environment has been, been really exploited there. Michael, can I bring you in now just as a more focused score, as they say, um, look, you have worked all your career in improving efficiency on farms and driving efficiency, adapting research onto farms, improving profitability and so on. Is that compatible with meeting the environmental challenges and restrictions that are out there and regulations and so on, particularly in the context, say, of upland farms and biodiversity? 
Yeah, look, I think it is, um, Jerry, and I, look, that not notwithstanding that there are problems there. I mean, if you compare sheep to, we'll say, the more intensive enterprises, I think we're very, very good on the lowland farming systems. Um, we're, you know, we're very nitrogen efficient. Sheep, you know, are, recycle a lot more nitrogen than other ruminants. We use a lot less nitrogen. If we look at the figures coming in from the National Farm Survey, even from our farms here, where we're very in, intensively stocked on some of the systems, we're using a lot less nitrogen than maybe some of our counterparts in the cattle. We're doing a lot of research on things like clover, which takes nitrogen, bag nitrogen out and takes it back out of the air. You know, so there's opportunities. Are, are we perfect as sheep farmer? Absolutely. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely, yes. You know, so I think we can um, big time improve on, on things, but I think we're very well placed um, and we're, we're starting, you know, very high up in terms of, of efficiency and in terms of meeting, you know, a lot of the environmental targets. If we go to our uplands, um, Jerry, I suppose we're in, from a biodiversity point of view and from an environmental point of view, probably ticking lots of boxes. The challenge, I suppose, from our profitability on those systems is, is much more. And that's what we're seeing uh, or have seen over the last kind of 20 years, sheep coming off the hills. You know, it's more profitable to keep them on the, on the, on the greener ground, you know, intensify them, get more lambs, not have that amount of work in terms of having to gather sheep, you know, not having the challenges of ticks and stuff. And I suppose there are challenges there and there's lots of EIPs that are addressing that. I suppose the one thing that, you know, what we're pushing on our hill farms when we look at what the better farms are doing is that we really now start having almost two flocks. We have a hill flock, which is spending most of its time on the hill, delivering real environmental goods up there, landscape management on the green ground down that we don't need for the hill flock. We have an intent, a more intensive lowland flock delivering profitability. Um, and really, I think our hill farmers... Um, need to start looking at what they have as being three distinct enterprises. Lots of them have cattle as well. So they're cattle farmers. They'll have hill sheep, which are basically their management tool for their environmental enterprise, which is the one that is bringing in the subsidies and the payments for managing that landscape. And I think that's what we need to look at it as we're farming three things. We're farming cattle, we're farming sheep, and we're farming the environment, and we're delivering lots of good, and we're very well placed on that. Uh, I think... Uh, Michael, the idea of farming the environment and treating as another enterprise with the supports from policy uh, is really a really a really interesting way of looking at at, at the issues facing uh, sheep farmers. Well, that viewers brings us to a close for this evening and indeed indeed a close to Virtual Sheep Week. And um, I think I would like to think we're ending on a positive note for the future. Uh, in summary, there's been an awful lot of information produced throughout the week in relation to research and advisory activity, in relation to environmental issues, and of course, to the efficient uh, management of a, of a sheep enterprise. I think also we've got insights this evening into the critical importance that an innovative scheme like the European, European Innovation Partnerships can contribute in shaping, indeed, the, the future, future environmental policy. It's really exciting for me to see, and for all of us, I'm sure, to see the, the new technologies that are coming onto farms. Um, and most importantly, we are identifying solutions, not problems. And this is really important for all farmers to understand as we move forward for a, in a challenging future. So this information and the new technologies that we talked about during the week will be invaluable to sheep farmers in enabling them to meet the challenges uh, of the new policy and regulatory um, context. I'd like to thank again our panelists this evening, Jack Nolan, Kevin Hanrahan, Michael Gottstein, and of course, uh, Dominica Kroll, who was on earlier in the discussion. And... I do need to thank my colleagues Declan McArdle and Trish Groves uh, for recording and editing the video clips and indeed for uh, managing this entire production this evening and of course all week as well. I would do want to, in addition, thank my colleagues in PR who have been a huge support to everyone in the promotion and running of the Virtual Sheep Week. And we owe an in, an in, a huge debt to our entire sheep team, our researchers, and our advisory colleagues right around the country who have made this event a reality. 
Big thanks also to FPD Insurance, who were our sponsors for the week. And most importantly, a big thank to you, the viewers, for tuning in and for all the questions that you submitted. I hope you found it informative and indeed enjoyable. And if we didn't get to answer all of your questions, we'll do our very best to respond to you in the days ahead. Uh, this broadcast, of course, with the social media release will, can be viewed on the Chagas public website. It's chagas.ie. And as I said, this is the last of our webinars. It's been running all week. I hope you've benefited from them. And again, remember to spread the message out there. If you want to catch up on the videos, tune in to chagas.ie. Thank you. And stay safe.